Okay, tonight's guest is Lyron Gertzman. And I'm, I know that there's a lot of people in the room that already know Lyron, because despite the fact that he's a very young man, he's probably not a young birder anymore, <laughs> because he's been birding for a very, very long time. When did you start birding, Lyron? Um, probably around the age of five. So around 2005, just like going for walks in the local parks with my parents who weren't birders, but they liked the outdoors. So, <laughs> yeah. well, Lyron became an awesome birder and, you know, even at a very young age was, was making trips over to Vancouver Island from the mainland to, to see what he could see over here. And, uh, there was often a lot of coordination of other birders to, to, uh, move him around to the various places. But one time he was over here, and uh, you guys might remember this, somebody found pink-footed geese out at Martindale Flats. Well, I know that most of the birders in Victoria got out to see those geese, and we have Lyron to thank for that, because he was, he was the sharp-eyed birder who figured out that they weren't just greater white-fronted geese, that they were something special for this area. He is an accomplished photographer, and his, his work has been seen by millions in some of the largest mu museums across the world, including the Natural History Museum in London and the Smithsonian. Pretty good for someone who hadn't even reached, you hadn't even reached 20 by that point, I think. Um, so he's, he also has swept the youth category at the 2018 Audubon Photography Awards and is now making his living well he's a student as well you're a student as well right uh yeah at the university of british columbia and uh making a living at the same time guiding and uh, hopefully getting some some money for some of the amazing photographs that he has so here is a well-traveled young man who uh has chosen his favorite place that he's going to present to us and uh, that is northern british columbia so with that I'm going to turn it over to Lyron, and thank you so much for joining us tonight. Oh, thank you so much for the introduction. I'm just going to share my screen here, so uh, hopefully you can see that there. I'm just pulling up the chat on the side. Yeah, it's okay. perfect. Thank you. Great. Yeah, so hi, everyone. Thanks so much for attending my presentation today. I'm really excited to present on this topic because, as Anne said, Northern British Columbia is my favorite place that I've ever visited. Um, but uh, just to tell you a little bit more whoops, about uh, this area, um, pictured here is, in my opinion, maybe one of the most spectacular places I've ever seen. This is the Salmon Glacier in northwestern British Columbia. To get there, you actually have to go through Hyder, uh, Alaska. So you have to go into Alaska and then back drive into British Columbia up some old mining roads. Um, and this glacier is a remnant of the last ice age. It's pretty crazy to think that not too long ago, uh, thousands of years ago, pretty much all of British Columbia was under a massive sheet of ice with the exception of some uh, coastal areas that were not. Um, but you'll see one of the themes that uh, I'll be talking about today that makes the north of British Columbia so special is its kind of biogeographic history. And the glacial history certainly is a important part of that. Um, this is one of the largest uh, glaciers in all of North America. I think it's the fourth largest. It is, like most glaciers, receding rapidly. Um, and climate change and the other impacts that we're having on northern British Columbia are also going to be things that I'm talking about today. Um, but just to tell you a little bit more about myself, this is a picture of me taken by my friend Ian Harland uh, in Kluani National Park, so actually in the Yukon Territory, but very, very close to the British Columbia border in the Northwest. Um, and as Anne said, I do currently study biology at the University of British Columbia. I'm in my fourth year, so I've got one more term to go that I'm already in the middle of here, and then I'll, I'll be graduating. Um, but what I really love to do is combine my love for photography and art and storytelling uh, with my love for science and biology to, uh, to kind of communicate science and, and tell these incredible stories about the birds and aspects of nature that we have here in British Columbia and around the world. So just here's, a, a, of course, a, a look at British Columbia from satellite imagery. And one of the main features that you'll see running through the province are mountains. And if you see kind of on the right side of the province of British Columbia there, you can see the amazing Rocky Mountains. 
And the Rocky Mountains uh, act as a real big barrier between eastern and western birds. So a lot of the birds that we see in the northeastern corner of British Columbia are on the eastern side of the Rocky Mountains. And therefore, they often resemble birds from the east part of North America, despite being in a western province. And on the west side of the Rocky Mountains, we have a lot of the western birds that we're used to seeing here in southwestern BC and, and other places on the coast. So in the northeast of the province is this really fascinating area where east meets west, and we'll be exploring that today as well. But also, if you kind of look more to the, the west side, the northwestern corner of British Columbia, you'll see some really impressive mountain ranges extending down into the northwestern corner of the province. And the northwestern corner of the province is kind of a place, in my opinion, where it kind of north kind of starts to meet south because the northwestern corner of BC is where we have the southern breeding uh, extreme for a lot of typically more Arctic loving species. Um, so the north of British Columbia is just this spectacular place with a really unique and interesting biogeographic history that has made for some really remarkable bird life present there today. So I wanted to start with some of these birds that are characteristic of this northern boreal forest that covers the vast majority of the north of British Columbia. And, you know, perhaps one of the most well known and most sought after of all of these birds is the beautiful great gray owl. Uh, this is a species that we get all the way down into southern British Columbia and even into the, the lower 48 states. But, um, you know, this is a really a bird of the boreal forest. And when you're driving around remote roads up in northern BC, um, if you get lucky, you might spot a beautiful great gray owl sitting on a fence post like this. And they really love the forest edges is where, is where you see them most. Often they'll just kind of work their way along old stumps or fence posts along the sides of forest hunting for rodents. And they have incredible hearing. Um, uh, they can apparently hear rodents that are underground, under the snow, and even just far distances away from them. And they use that incredible hearing to hunt rodents that are completely uh, hidden from view. So for this next photo here, the owl was sitting on that post that you see there. Um, it was right at dusk um, and it was just beautifully silhouetted against the sunset sky. And I just kind of crouched down in the grass uh, with my telephoto lens some distance away and waited anticipating that the owl would eventually take off and hunt. And I was pretty thrilled when it takeoff direction was straight towards me and it dove down right into the grass. Um, and it did come up empty handed that time, but it, uh, I have seen them come up with their prey several times and it's a really spectacular thing to see. So let's look at some other birds that are kind of characteristic of the boreal forest up north. And one of my favorites of the little birds is this one here. This is the boreal chickadee. We of course have four species of chickadees in British Columbia. On Vancouver Island, uh, just the chestnutback chickadee is the regular one, but in much of BC, there's also the black cap chickadee and in the interior, you also get mountain chickadees. But the most common chickadee up in northern BC tends to be the boreal chickadee, um, pictured here. And it's, a, it's, one of, it's probably my favorite chickadee species. They're, they're really cute little birds. There's also some really beautiful uh, birds up there. And one of the, the very beautiful species, in my opinion, is this one here. This is a bohemian waxwing. Um, of course, down here, we're more familiar with the cedar waxwings. And up north, you do get cedar waxwings as well breeding. And in some cases, you can see cedar waxwings and bohemian wax, waxwings breeding in the same areas side by side. Uh, this was taken at the Laird River Hot Springs, where you can see both species. And the northern part of British Columbia is kind of a more southerly area compared to where a lot of bohemian waxwings do breed further north. Kind of up in the higher elevation alpine environments, there's some really unique birds, one of which was mentioned earlier on the call today, the, the gray crowned rosy finch, which is actually not a bird you see, I find, in the trees all that often during the breeding season. Um, I, I tend to run into them more just kind of running around on the ground in the tundra, but this uh, beautiful bird perched up on the top of, uh, of this tree here and made for a really, really nice photograph. If there's one bird that kind of encapsulates the feeling of being up there though, it might be the white-throated sparrow, um, especially kind of in the Northeast part of the province. Uh, you wake up in the morning and the chorus is often dominated by the beautiful whistling song of white-throated sparrows. And it's just one of those things when I think about camping in the North of British Columbia, I think of the songs of the white-throated sparrows. 
Some birds up there are birds that nest all throughout the province, like this olive-sided flycatcher, which I photographed at the top of this tree on an absolutely bucketing rainy day. The weather is often unpredictable up there. We get a lot of sun, we get a lot of rain, and it often changes very quickly, especially when you're in the northern Rocky Mountains in these mountainous areas. And you've got birds like this one, the Wilson snipe. Um, and the snipe is a bird that I'm always blown away by the versatility of habitat that they will be found in. You'll be in lowland agricultural areas and you'll see snipe. You'll be kind of in forest side wetlands and you'll see snipe. And then you'll be way up in the alpine above where trees grow. It's like below zero and you see Wilson snipes. So I'm always blown away by this bird and just how well they've adapted to a huge variety of environments. But in addition to some of these more widespread and regular breeders, there's also some breeding species in Northern British Columbia, which we'll look at today, that are quite a bit more rare. Um, and one of those is the Pacific loon. Um, there's only a handful of breeding pairs of Pacific loon that have been found in British Columbia. So it was really exciting to come across this pair out on a lake. Um, and I've uh, been to this lake a couple times. The first time I was there, they were sitting on some eggs. And the second time I was there, they had some chicks in tow. Um, so this is a species that just barely breeds in British Columbia, right up kind of along the Yukon border area is where um, these birds breed, but there is just a very small number of pairs that are breeding in the province, although it is very remote. So there could be areas kind of away from where humans can easily access where they could be found as well. Now, when we think about birds in Northern British Columbia, there are several different strategies that they employ for their lives. We've got migrating birds, uh, and I would say probably the majority of species that, that are found up there are migratory, um, heading up there in the springtime, breeding there in the summer, and then migrating out uh, away in the fall. You've also got species that are year round residents, like the boreal chickadee, for example, um, and just birds that tough it out all year round. And then you've got birds that are nomadic, which are, I think, greatly represented by the finches and specifically the crossbills. Um, this bird here, the white winged crossbills, some years when I've been in northern BC, this has been by far the most abundant bird around. They're just everywhere. And other years you're up there and they're pretty hard to find. It can take uh, quite a bit of time to find even one. So these crossbills have a really interesting nomadic lifestyle where they're kind of following around the availability of food. Usually kind of, in, they'll be where trees are producing a lot of uh, uh, cones and cones with seeds. So some years they're there and some years they're not. So there are white wing crossbills up there and there are also red crossbills up in this area as well. But this red crossbill pictured here is actually a very special red crossbill. This isn't just any red crossbill. This is what is known as a type seven or enigmatic red crossbill. Um, and as far as I'm aware, this might be the first photograph ever taken of a type seven uh, enigmatic crossbill. Um, so just in case you're not aware with these birds, there are uh, 11 or so types of red crossbills in North America. Um, and they are best distinguished by their calls. They also have slightly different beak sizes, um, which tend to correspond to the types of cones that they like to visit, but they are best distinguished by their calls. Down here in the south of British Columbia and on Vancouver Island, type three tends to be the most common. Um, type four is also somewhat regular. In some years, there's some type twos around. On the west coast of Vancouver Island, we have type tens, um, but this bird here, the type seven, is probably the crossbill in all of North America and arguably in the world that has kind of do been documented the least uh, and the least is known about. So the area where I found this crossbill with my good friend pictured here, Josh Brown, um, was Stone Mountain Provincial Park in the Northern Rockies, a few hours west of Fort Nelson. And you can see up in the distance, there's a bunch of trees in a valley and that's the area where we found these uh, very rare birds. And we encountered a, a flock of birds that, um, that was feeding on these lodgepole pine cones, um, which was which very uh, fun to watch them use their beaks to like pry open the, uh, these cones in, the, uh, in, in this like really beautiful subalpine area. But was really even more exciting than just seeing these uh, red crossbills foraging was that they had young in tow. And these type seven red crossbills were feeding these little young, which were actively following around their dad and begging for food. And that was really, really exciting to see. Now, although these crossbills are quite rare, um, it's really, they're, they're found 
well, we're, there's researchers like Matt Young from the French Research Network actively kind of trying to figure out where these birds are found, but it's often that oftentimes these birds are simply underreported, underdetected, found in remote areas. But this was the first uh, like photograph documented breeding record in the province of British Columbia. Um, so it did uh, lead to this publication in the BCFO journal about the first documented confirmed breeding uh, of the type seven red crossbill in British Columbia, which was pretty exciting. But moving on to some of the other birds that are found up in the north of BC, another family uh, and group of birds that are one of my favorites are these chickens. Um, and pictured here is a, a ruffed grouse uh, with her chick on the side of a road. And it is quite entertaining to watch these grouse as they scurry across the road. And these mother grouse are quite dedicated. Um, I, I've often seen you're driving down a, a, a like in a logging road or an oil uh, road, and you'll see kind of the grouse appear at the side and then all the chicks uh, appear. And often the, the mother grouse will just kind of wait in the middle of the road or fly up onto a tree branch until all those young have ran across the road before she'll guide them down into the woods. Now, baby grouse are precocial, meaning that they are fully capable of looking after themselves in the sense that they can fly very quickly after just a few days, probably. They can find food on their own. So the main thing they're relying on their mom for is just kind of the guidance and protection against potential predators and leading them around to produ productive feeding areas and that sort of thing. But in addition to these grouse that we get in the lowlands, there's a really amazing group of birds that I'm sure you've heard of that are found up in the alpine environment. And that is the, uh, the rock ptarmigan and other ptarmigan species. Um, there's an area called Pink Mountain in the Northeast of British Columbia, which is considered um, probably the most reliable place to find rock ptarmigan in all of the province of British Columbia, but they're still not easy to find. And that's because ptarmigan change their feathers to match their surroundings throughout the year. So in the winter time, they are beautiful and white to blend into the snow. But in the summertime, they turn this, this uh, you know, rich kind of brownish gray color um, to match their tundra surroundings. And although you, know, you would think they blend in really well, there's this time in between seasons when the snow has melted, but the rock ptarmians are still this beautiful white color mixed in with the brown. And you would think that this might be a good time of year to try to track them down when they're in between these plumages. Well, that's what I thought, but it turns out they're still very difficult to find. Here's another photo of the same rock ptarmigan. And if you take a look down, just kind of down and left of center there, you can see a, uh, a, a, this rock ptarmigan hunkered down among the rocks and I'll magnify that here. It's amazing how this rock ptarmigan seems to know how much this intermediate plumage between its winter and summer plumage matches these lichen covered rocks. And it was really taking advantage of that um, and blending in with this, uh, this beautiful alpine environment. But in addition to these kind of year round residents like ptarmigan, a lot of the birds that really attract bird watchers to Northern British Columbia are these more Eastern species, which are migrating into the area during the spring and staying there for the breeding season. So let's take a look at some of these migratory species that are more typical of Eastern North America. Here's a beautiful one. This is the rose-breasted grosbeak, um, a, a kind of fairly common bird in the Peace River region. They're not necessarily easy to find, but there are quite a few of them around. They have a beautiful song um, and they're just an absolutely gorgeous bird to, uh, to see and to listen to. So this is one of these birds that is mostly an Eastern North American species, but reaches the kind of Western limit of its range in Northern British Columbia. Here's another species uh, that's kind of close to its Western limit in Northern BC, that's the yellow-bellied sapsucker. And these birds are actually extremely easy to find in the uh, summertime, and that's because they have nests all over the place and their young are very, very noisy. So if you just go through a, for a walk through the woods in the summer, you're bound to hear the begging calls of these uh, of young yellow-bellied sapsuckers in their nests. Um, and they are very, very beautiful birds and fun to watch, but very easy to find. On the other hand, some other birds are much more scarce and difficult to find. And this is one of those. This is the Baltimore Oriole, um, another bird at its far western extreme in the Peace River region of British Columbia. It's a beautiful bird. Uh, but one that can be a little tricky to track down. Um, you know, it often takes many attempts and some years they're, they're a lot rarer than others as well.
but just a beautiful bird that you find up there. And other birds are more subtle, but also, in my opinion, very special. This is another kind of Peace River region specialty, the Leconte Sparrow, a really neat looking sparrow, a very unique uh, pattern. And if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, I think there was one found recently in the last year or two uh, in Souk, maybe, in the, on Vancouver Island. So, so that was definitely an exciting find down there. But now let's move into some of the warbler species that are found in this region. And this is perhaps the most beautiful, although of course it depends who you ask, but this spectacular bird here is the magnolia warbler. Um, and they just are this ultimate combination of yellow and black streaking with that beautiful white eye arcs and this gray crown. It's an absolutely spectacular bird. Here's another one uh, with a very, very high pitched song. This is the black pole warbler. Um, it is, like I said, an incredibly high pitched song. Um, and it is one kind of found throughout Northern British Columbia and up in the Yukon territory and up into Alaska. In fact, this bird undertakes some really incredible long distance migrations between its wintering grounds and its summer grounds. And we'll talk more about these warbler migrations in a moment. Here's another one of my favorite warblers in the region, the Canada warbler. Um, again, a bird reaching its range extreme up there. And uh, another bird with a really beautiful song. Sounds a little bit like a yellow warbler, but quite different if you get to learn the differences. Um, and they're locally common. If you know which habitat to look in, you can find quite a few of these birds. So let's talk a little bit more about their migration. Thanks to citizen science platforms like eBird run by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, um, they've been able to generate these incredible uh, visual simulations of the migration of birds. So this one here will show us what the migration of the Canada warbler looks like. So you can see in the winter time, they're in South America, they're heading up, migrating into North America in the summer. And if you look up in British Columbia, I'll play this again in a moment, British Columbia is the real extreme of how far these birds go. So down here in the winter, you can see they're mostly in what looks to me like the slopes of the Andes in uh, Peru, Colombia, Ecuador, that sort of area. Here we are in February, March, April, and May. You can see them really migrating up. And here in, I'll pause it here, in July, right up in the northeastern corner of British Columbia at the top left of the screen, that is the extreme. That is the furthest that these birds are going. Um, and it makes them a, a really special bird to have here in BC, given that we're kind of a Western province, but this is an Eastern bird. So you can find a lot of these really incredible um, animations on eBird and they're just really fun to look through. And a lot of the warblers in this area follow a similar migratory pattern. Uh, this species here is the Tennessee warbler. It is often the most common warbler species in the area, um, a little less colorful than some of the other ones, and their song is much more mechanical. Um, I find almost like Junko-like. There's a lot, a lot of trills and stuff in there, a little different from the other warblers, but like I said, one of the most common warblers in the area. And here's another warbler. This one has a very high-pitched song, and it's a really unique-looking bird. This is the black and white warbler. But this next warbler has an even higher pitched song than the black and white warbler, and that is the Cape May warbler, pictured here. Now, the Cape May warbler is definitely one of the rarer breeding bird species in British Columbia, and the Cape May warbler, along with some other species, are often uh, more somewhat eruptive in the northeastern corner of the province. So some years, there will be almost none at all, and other years, they will be kind of rare but locally you'll be able to find them somewhat commonly in like local habitats. And this tends to be driven by the availability of food, of course, um, and they are often particularly common during outbreaks of the spruce budworm or other um, kind of insects that undergo outbreaks in Northern British Columbia. A really beautiful bird, like I said, one of the rarest breeders in British Columbia, but uh, this next bird, the bay-breasted warbler, is probably an even rarer breeder in British Columbia than the Cape May warbler, although it probably varies year to year. Um, despite it being rare over the years, I've been fortunate to encounter these birds several times and they also have an extremely high pitched song. But you know, when you see a bird at the extreme of its range, that's very difficult to find. It's always just a really exciting thing. And there's been a couple years recently where these birds have uh, been found in quite unusually high numbers in the Fort St. John area. Um, which has made for some, some big smiles on a lot of birders' faces, because this is a, a beautiful and rare bird in the province of British Columbia. Now, in addition to just being a place that gets a lot of eastern, eastern species, 
The north of British Columbia is also a place where east kind of meets west. And we'll look at a couple examples here. On the left, you might recognize the Townsend's warbler, a species that is a quite a common breeding bird in our coastal rainforests, and even throughout much of the interior of the province. And on the right there is a black-throated green warbler, an extremely closely related species to the Townsend's warbler, but again, a different bird, one that is more characteristic of Eastern North America. However, in the north of British Columbia is kind of the only place in the world where these two birds are regularly coming into contact and meeting each other. Um, where, the, where the Rockies pass through Northern BC, you've got a little bit of birds kind of bleeding into these mountains in that area coming over from east to west and west to east and these birds meet. And there's been some research done on this by Darren Irwin and, and other researchers. Darren Irwin's a professor who I've had at the University of British Columbia, um, studying the hybridization between these two species. And they have found that although these, do, these two birds do regularly hybridize where they meet, the zone where they hybridize is very narrow and it's stable. So in other words, these birds are meeting, hybridizing, but the hybrids are not expanding out into the range of these other of either species. In fact, the hybrids tend to have pretty low fitness, which means that they're not finding mates. No one really wants to pair up with these hybrid birds. Um, so these, these pure birds are, tend to be more successful. So for that reason, even though these two birds do hybridize, they are considered two separate good species. Here's three species that all look very similar and are all closely related that also all meet in Northeastern British Columbia. In the top right corner, you might recognize the McGillivray's warbler, another bird that we see throughout uh, much of British Columbia and is another bird that we find breeding on the coast here. In the top left is the morning warbler, um, which does hybridize once again with the McGillivray's warbler in small numbers where they meet in Northern British Columbia. And this is probably the only place in the world where this happens. And in the bottom center here is the elusive Connecticut warbler. Um, Connecticut warblers are another one of these very rare breeders up in Northern British Columbia. They're very hard to find, but uh, when there's one around, you'll likely hear them because they have this incredibly loud song that's often described as explosive. It just explodes out of the forest. It's a really incredible thing to experience. And these birds just love these really dense aspen forests, which makes them difficult to get your eyes on but uh, very uh, easy to hear if you've got one around on territory. But again, all these birds meeting in one area. Now, sometimes you've got birds like this that are very closely related and all kind of resemble each other. Other times you've got birds that are not that closely related that look almost identical. So on the left here is a hermit thrush. It's uh, a member of you know, the thrush robin family, Turtidae. Um, and on the right is the oven bird, which is actually a member of the warbler family, family Perulidae. And these two birds look almost identical, but they are not that closely related, being in separate families. Um, I would have to think that this is a good example of convergent evolution, where you know two not super closely related species have kind of evolved similar colors simply because it works well in their environment. I'm guessing this sort of coloration provides good camouflage in their environment. And it's kind of neat. These are two species you can see in northern BC. And the oven bird, uh, you know, northern BC is the only place where you can see it in the province. You've also got birds that look different, but are the same species. So this is, of course, the yellow rumped warbler. And on the right side, you can see the Audubon's yellow rumped warbler um, with its yellow throat. And on the left side, you can see the Myrtle yellow rumped warbler with its right, uh, white throat and black mask. Um, we tend to see more Audubon's yellow rumped warblers kind of in Western British Columbia, although we do definitely get some myrtles migrating through as well. And in the east of British Columbia, you, you tend to see a lot of myrtle yellow rumped warblers and, and a lot less of the Audubon's yellow rumped warblers. However, these two species do hybrid, sorry, these, this, this species, it's just one species, they do hybridize pretty extensively and it's not that uncommon um, to see birds that kind of show mixed features. So despite these birds looking different, they are one species. Here's a, another species pair. On the left, our provincial bird, the Stellar's jay, and on the right, the blue jay. Once again, northern BC is a place where these two birds meet, but hybridization is very rare between these two species, although it does happen. So this is one of the most fascinating species pairs, in my opinion, that, that we have in the province, the winter wren and the Pacific wren. And if you've been birding for a while, um, you uh, have probably remember the split that occurred around 2010, I think it was, 
where we used to just have the winter wren, but it was decided that some of these western birds were genetically distinct from the eastern birds and they were renamed to be the Pacific wren. Now, Northern BC is where this research was done, again by uh, Darren Irwin at UBC and his students. Um, they took a look at birds in the Tumbler Ridge area and they found that there were two different songs that birds would sing in this area. So I'll play them for you now. We'll start with the Pacific Wren, a, a song that you'll probably be familiar with if you've spent some time in our local rainforests in the, in the spring and summer. So this beautiful song, uh, a little shrill, high pitched, a little mechanical at times. So that is the Pacific Wren. And now let's take a listen to the Winter Wren. So it's a very similar song, but it's a little different. And if you spend enough time listening to these two birds, um, you will start to kind of really hear differences in these songs that are very, very distinct, and you, you'll no longer uh, be confusing them. They, although they sound similar, the Pacific Wren, I find it's just a little higher pitched, a little more shrill, a little more mechanical than the Winter Wren. Um, both songs very loud, both birds tend to like similar habitats, and both birds only meet in Northern British Columbia. Um, but despite them looking almost identical, the birds don't breed with each other pretty much at all. Um, uh, Darren Irwin's team looked at, uh, they took a uh, genetic analysis of lots and lots and lots of birds, and they were only managed to find one or two birds that appeared to have intermediate genetics. So these two birds are, despite looking completely different, are probably using these auditory cues to, uh, to tell who's who and are two separate good species, the winter wren and the Pacific wren. So, I wanted to uh, start to talk a little bit about um, some of the conservation related issues that are active in Northern British Columbia. We've had this introduction now to these incredible birds that are found in the region, but uh, being it's, this area isn't just interesting uh, from a, a biological perspective and a biogeographical perspective. This area is also of great interest to uh, industry and natural resource extraction. It's a very rich environment. Pictured here, is um, a area called Watson Slough in the Peace River region of British Columbia. This beautiful sedge marsh, which you see here, is one of few places where the uh, yellow rail, a species of special concern in Canada, breeds. Um, it's a very, very rare species in British Columbia. But unfortunately, this entire valley, pretty much everything you see in this image, is going to be completely flooded very soon upon the completion of the Site C Dam project in the Peace River region. Now this project um, is gonna be producing a lot of energy, mostly for exports, but it's gonna be producing a lot of energy, um, but it's going to have a very high environmental to toll. And it's actually considered to be one of the most environmentally damaging pro uh, projects in the history of Canada. But as if you know, direct habitat loss wasn't enough for birds like these yellow rails, there's other things at play as well. Um, climate change is of course having an impact on this region as it is everywhere. And one thing that's been occurring as it did this past year is a little bit of drought. This past year, as I'm sure we all remember, was very hot and very dry. And a lot of the wetlands um, in Northeastern British Columbia when I was there this year were abnormally dry. And this year, uh, as far as I'm aware, um, no one that I know and, and uh, of all the birders up there, no one that I know managed to find a yellow rail in British Columbia this year. Um, which is pretty unusual. Most years, these birds are, you can find them. Um, so this, these, and it was possibly due to the fact that a lot of these sedge wetlands were very, very dry compared to normal. Um, so climate change is definitely having an impact on this area as well. And one thing that I witnessed while I was up there this past summer was forest fire. And let's talk a little bit about, uh, about forest fire. Um, this was actually right in the middle of that big heat wave. It was about 36 degrees on the day that I took this picture up in northeastern BC. It was even hotter, I know, down on the southwest coast. Um, and some lightning had passed through the area. And uh, there was no rain, though. So this lightning ignited some fires. Um, and uh, my friend Josh and I were driving down the highway when we spotted the, all the smoke and the flames in the distance. But the cell reception wasn't too great. So once we reached cell reception, 
we uh, we called it in. It had already been reported by uh, by others earlier that day, but uh, it was quite something to witness. You know the power of fire, and this fire near Bucking Horse River ultimately burned thousands of hectares of forest. Now, fire is of course a natural part of uh, ecosystems, um, and we'll explore that a little bit because there's a lot of birds and animals and trees that very much benefit from and rely on, fi uh, on fire for the proper function of their ecosystem. However, um, what we are seeing right now is uh, as a result of a lot of things, including climate change and uh, a lot of fire suppression over the years and uh, you know, mismanagement of forests, um, we are seeing an increase in fires in a lot of areas. Um, and a lot of these fires, uh, when they, you know, they completely obliterate the ecosystem. So they are eerily quiet when you're kind of in a recent burn. But it doesn't take long um, for succession to begin. And you start to see very quickly grass and bushes start to grow and the first bird songs beginning to return. But it does feel pretty devastating just to kind of see endless landscapes as far as you can see that have all been completely burned. And here's an example of that. Uh, this was taken with a, with a drone sending it up in the air to look around and pretty much in every direction all the way to the horizon is just burnt forest. But let's talk about a bird that benefits from these burnt forests. Like I said, fire does have an important ecological role. Some trees uh, benefit from fire and that it helps them drop their seeds and provides good soil for those seeds to grow. And some birds are very well adapted to fire such as the black-backed woodpecker. Um, this bird is most frequently found in burns. So areas that have been previously had a forest fire pass through in years past that would, uh, you know, it's very soft and, and there's a lot of insects in there. So these black backed woodpeckers can come in and chip away at this soft dead burnt wood and get all those insects really easily. So this is one bird that is, you know, very closely tied to fire. And I don't know if anyone's researched this, but I look at a black backed woodpecker and I see that completely black back. And I got to think that perhaps that's an adaptation for being in burnt woods, because they're often in trees that are completely charred and black. So perhaps that uh, is a good camouflage in that, in that environment. But uh, in addition to you know, fire and climate change, there's a lot of additional pressures going on in this area. Um, and of course, one that is of increasing public uh, awareness and controversy as of late is forestry. And forestry is obviously very important for many reasons. We use wood quite a bit. However, it is having a negative impact on a lot of species up in northern British Columbia. And it's pretty devastating to see this over and over and over and over uh, at times when exploring the, the back roads in British Columbia. And that's my friend Ian there in front of a big pile of, uh, of logs. But one of the species that forestry practices are having the biggest impact on, um, or at least one that is getting the most public attention, uh, are caribou. So caribou, um, are a, is a species that does quite well in mature forests. They do spend some of the year up in the alpine environment as pictured here, um, but they, they rely on forests quite a bit that are you know, mature and intact. They're, some of the food that they eat like lichen are more common in those environments. And as a result of changes to the landscape, um, caribou have declined quite a bit. So with clear cuts, um, the caribou just don't do well in kind of clear cut and environments that have active forestry for several reasons, lack of food, lack of proper habitat, but also this, these forestry practices are providing easier access for predators like wolves to reach the environments where caribou are found. Um, so wolves are uh, exhibiting a predation threat onto caribou, which is obviously something that has happened for a very, very long time. But now, because all of a sudden the caribou are at very uh, high risk due to you know, forestry practices and you know, unsustainable forestry practices that occur in some of these areas, um, they are now at increased uh, threats to any kind of pressure that comes their way, which in can include things like wolves. Um, now, of course, wolves aren't the reason why we're losing caribou. The reason why caribou have declined over the years is, is primarily the cause of it is land changes and habitat loss. But the BC government is spending millions of dollars, I think about $2 million in the winters in the 2019 and 2020 winter, um, killing wolves in British Columbia in an attempt to save caribou. This is very controversial. Um, obviously, wolves are known to provide an incredibly important role in the ecosystem, and they are not the source of this problem. So uh, we definitely need better 
forestry management practices that are more sustainable uh, to sustain caribou in this area. But it's even more complicated than that because you've got other species in this area like moose, which benefit a little bit from forestry practices. Moose tend to do well in clear cut environments. There's often a lot of growth in clear cuts. Um, there's a lot of exposure to the sun. So the moose come in, they forage, they get good food availability. So the moose will do well. They might experience population increases. And now all of a sudden the wolves have more food available in the form of moose, which increases the wolf population. So the moral of the story here is basically that habitat changes have led to a little bit of an ecosystem imbalance here. Um, and uh, it's led to the, the decline in caribou populations and mass killing of wolves, um, which is very sad uh, for me, someone who loves these animals very much. So we definitely need to do better when it comes to, uh, to you know, sustaining these environments in a way that retains the natural balance because it would be devastating to lose these caribou, um, a really incredible species that has lived in this area for so, so long. But while we're on the topic of mammals, I did want to introduce you to a few of the other mammal species that you find in this region. One of which is this one here, the stone sheep. Um, and Northern BC is home to the vast majority of the globe's population of stone sheep. The stone sheep is a, a subspecies of the dull sheep, which is a close relative of the bighorn sheep. Um, and sometimes you find these animals up in the Alpine. Sometimes you find them a little lower down in the woods. Um, and this one was sitting at the edge of a cliff on a, on a bucketing rainy day, chewing its uh, cud or resting, I don't know, something like that, just on the side of this cliff. But it was, uh, it was fun to watch and, uh, and just a beautiful animal with those, with those big horns. This photo here I captured on a very stormy day. This was actually the same day that I photographed that forest fire when these storms were passing through as some lightning. So there was a lot of uh, dramatic skies, dramatic clouds. And I spotted this stone sheep just coming up at the top of a ridge in the distance. And I captured this photo here and I converted it to black and white just to really highlight the tones in the clouds, matching the tones in the sheep and in the alpine environment. It was just a really beautiful scene. Another wildlife species that we find up in Northern BC in the Northern Rockies is this one here, the wood bison. And the wood bison is the largest land mammal in North America. They are a really spectacular animal. And bison were, heavily hunted upon the arrival of uh, you know, European settlers to North America. They completely wiped out bison to near extinction and they disappeared from the vast majority of their range. And I believe it was the early 1900s, around 1906, when the last like wild bison was shot and killed in British Columbia. However, around 1995, they started reintroducing bison back to this area. And they are now one, uh, a very common sight along the Alaska Highway in the Northern Rockies. And they're just really stunning animals to watch. I mean, just look, I mean, just look at these, these incredible animals. This one was captured here on a really foggy and windy and rainy day. And again, I just put this photo into black and white to, uh, to emphasize that, uh, that feeling of the gloomy weather on that particular day. And these bison do often hang out close to the highway. Um, often they will just end up in the middle of the road. I once saw a, uh, a, a calf drinking milk from its mom just in the middle of the road. Um, and often they'll just kind of walk down and or anything, but it's important because they are obviously huge and powerful animals. And this one was uh, walking down the road and I uh, just took that opportunity to use my telephoto lens to get this, this detailed shot of the fur and all the little bits of leaves and, and uh, dust in the fur of this bison. And this here was a really interesting encounter. Um, uh, these bison were all kind of sitting down um, in the grass and a black bear kind of emerged out of the forest down the way and started walking straight towards the bison with what seemed to me like quite a bit of intention. Um, it was really, you know, directly walking towards them. Now, I do not think there's a world where a black bear can take down any bison, um, maybe like a, a injured calf or something, but um, I don't really see that happening. These bears tend to spend the vast majority of the time just eating grass and flowers um, in this area. Uh, but upon the bear approaching, the bison all stood up and started walking towards the bear. And that bear very quickly turned around and ran off into the distance, which was probably a very good decision on the bear's part. I don't think the bison would have taken well to that bear uh, getting too close to them. 
Speaking of bears, you see a lot of bears up in northern British Columbia. Um, it's not, I've had several days where I've seen like 20, 25 bears in one day. Um, there are a lot of them up there. So of course, when you're out in an area where there's bears, it's important to be respectful and educated about these bears. Um, not, uh, you know, not approaching these bears, keeping a tidy campsite, not having your food out, carrying bear spray when you're out hiking, just being respectful. And when you do encounter bears, just uh, always monitor their behavior um, to make sure that bear is not being uh, upset by your presence or, or its behavior being altered by your presence. Um, these are beautiful animals. Uh, bears often kind of get a really bad reputation for being these dangerous creatures. But from my experience, um, they just really like to eat grass and, uh, and not move around all that much a lot of the time. Um, and I have uh, encountered hundreds of bears. I mean, I'm probably getting close to like 500 encounters with bears. And I'm happy to say that I've yet to have one single negative encounter with a bear. But of course, that, uh, pr that probably has to do with, you know, making sure I'm educated, respectful um, uh, around these bears and in their environment. And it's not just black bears that you have in this region. There are also grizzly bears in this area. You don't see them as much, but they are definitely around. Um, but one really incredible moment came when I was driving down uh, a highway in Northwestern BC. And I'm, I just spotted out of the corner of my eye, like a little bit of movement uh, coming up ahead on the shoulder of the road. So I slowed down and then all of a sudden this mother bear emerged and then one head popped out, then another head popped out, then another head popped out. And this mother bear uh, stood at the side of the road for a moment with her three cubs and they crossed the road all together and, and went off into the woods on the other side. Um, and, you know, looking at the expression on the faces of these cubs, it's hard not to believe there's emotion here uh, going on in this picture. These are, these are absolutely amazing animals. But speaking of amazing animals and amazing places, let's get back to the birds. And uh, in doing so, I want to take you to the far northwestern corner of British Columbia, the region known as the Haines Triangle. And if I had to pick one area that was really like my one favorite place on earth that I've ever been to, I would say it's the Haines Triangle. I've been fortunate to visit this area three times I've, uh, on three trips. I've been there in 2017, 2019, and 2021. And each trip just blew me away. And every time I go back there, I want to go there more. So where exactly is the Haines Triangle? Well, let's pull up a map. Here's the province of British Columbia. And if you look up way in the far left corner of this image, you can see a pin I put there for Tachinshini Alsek Provincial Park, um, which is a, a large park in this area. Um, this is the Haines Triangle. It's, a, it's a spot, an area of British Columbia that you can only access driving through the Yukon like down through Whitehorse or coming in from Southeast Alaska. Like if you get a ferry to Haines or something like that, you can drive in from Southeast Alaska uh, up the Haines Highway into the Haines Triangle. But this region is just absolutely spectacular. Um, the mountains coming through this area are the St. Elias Mountains, um, which is I believe the tallest or one of the tallest mountain ranges in all of North America. Uh, Mount Logan is part of this mountain range, which is the tallest mountain in all of Canada. And there's just spectacular views of endless peaks and glaciers, and it makes for an incredible area to spend some time. This is a picture of my friend Josh. We were, we were hiking up in the tundra, and I just spotted this hill up in the distance, and this big mountain, Three Guardsmen, was the peak was poking about above the clouds. So I was like, hey, Josh, just go. Do you mind running up ahead of me there and standing on that rock? So Josh went up ahead, and, uh, and I snapped this photo of him um, standing, looking over at the landscape at the beautiful three Guardsmen Mountain in the Haines Triangle. But let's look at some of the birds that are found in this region, because in my opinion, it's the scenery, but also the birds that make this place really, really special. You've got a lot of birds breeding in this area that are typically more northern breeders coming down kind of to the southern end of their breeding range. And this bird here might be familiar, because we do get it as a migrant in migration here in the, on the BC coast. This is the semi-palmated plover. but. Uh, it's really cool to be up in the mountains and to see pairs of these birds running around in the tundra. It's a really neat experience. And here's a photo of a, of a semi-palmated plover on top of a rock in front of the beautiful Three Guardsmen Mountain. Um, I mean, what a landscape. To see a bird that I'm so used to seeing on beaches and mudflats, to see it in the mountains in the tundra is really, really special. Here's another photo of a uh, semi-palmated plover, a, a bit of more of a close-up. 
And often when they migrate through uh, my area here in Vancouver and elsewhere on the BC coast, we don't get to see them all that all the time in their beautiful breeding colors. So it's really nice to see them in these colors up in the Haines Triangle, where they are one of the most common of the breeding shorebirds in the area. Here's another shorebird that nests there, which is quite a bit less common than the uh, semi-palmated plover. And you can see it on the rock there. And this is a, one of these birds that is kind of at a southern extreme point of its breeding range in northwestern BC. And this is the wandering tattler, um, a little bit of a rarer bird in British Columbia. You know, we definitely get them on the coast here, but uh, not as many as some of these other species. So it's really cool that we have wandering tattlers nesting in British Columbia. I find one of the habitats you tend to encounter them the most are kind of around these lakes and riverbeds up in the alpine high above the tree line where you've got a lot of big boulders and a lot of kind of water spread out running through the alpine and in these rivers. That's where I find I, I've encountered these wandering tattlers the most, um, but they're just these really beautiful and fascinating birds and to see them in their breeding plumage as well is, is, is very, very cool. So here's a map of the world. Um, and I wanted to pull this up because the wandering tattler has a very impressive migration. Um, this is a bird that spends much of the year in the South Pacific, um, Hawaii and the South Pacific Islands, I believe, you know, like French Polynesia and that area there. Uh, they're a bird that loves those white sand beaches. So that's like, you can kind of see that on the bottom left and bottom right of this map. And then they, and then they migrate all the way up into the mountains of, you know, the Yukon and Alaska and throughout Northern Canada and into Northern BC. So this is a really, really special bird. And here's another look at one of these birds at the edge of a lake in, in beautiful sunset light. And it's worth mentioning that sunset lasts a long time and, and you get light, you know, at midnight, it's still light enough to be walking around out there and the sun rises again just a few hours later. So it's, uh, it's a, 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 an area that has a lot of daylight. So kind of figuring out when you're gonna sleep is sometimes a little bit difficult, um, but it's all worth it to see amazing birds like these wandering tattlers. Here's another shorebird, which is uh, one of the more common shorebird species in the Haines Triangle. This is the lesser yellow legs. And um, again, a bird that I'm used to seeing in wetlands and on mud flats around here. So it's very bizarre to me to see shorebirds perched in trees. Um, but you see that up in the Haines Triangle and the lesser yellow legs is just uh, one of those most common shorebirds that nests in the area. One of my favorite habitats to explore up there are the wetlands and a lot of the wetlands, almost every single kind of large wetland pond area up there will have a pair of trumpeter swans on it. Um, and these are beautiful birds, huge birds, and a lot of fun birds to watch. But another bird you sometimes encounter in these more kind of valley areas are short-eared owls, um, which is again, a really neat bird for me as someone from Southwestern British Columbia from the coast. It's a really neat bird for me to think about as being a bird that you encounter up in the mountains in the tundra and in the, this like willow subalpine habitat. But uh, you know, while hiking up there, this short-eared owl came and just kind of did this beautiful pass right overhead here. And I snapped this photo against the overcast skies and it was just a really beautiful thing to see. Now, the next bird I'm gonna show you is very, very special. And I have to give a shout out and credit to Sid, Sid Cannings for this one, because Sid and some friends um, were, the, were the people who discovered this bird here breeding in British Columbia. So if you see at the top of the tree there, there's a shorebird sitting there with a down curved beak, and this is a whimbrel. And just a few years ago, that was when this bird was discovered for the first time to be breeding in British Columbia, a first breeding record for the province. And uh, there were, I believe, a couple pairs uh, discovered by Sid. And uh, hiking through the, you know, the willow shrubbery in this area is no easy task. Um, so it feels really good when you emerge at the edge of the wetland and then immediately you see this whimbrel flying right at you, calling and alarming. And obviously they're not big fans of having you in their habitat. So it was, uh, it was, you know, I wanted to kind of limit my time spending in their area there because they were definitely actively breeding, showing that agitated behavior. But it was really, really neat to see whimbrels like nesting in the province of British Columbia. So this bird was up in the tree, it flew down um, along with its mate uh, was also nearby and it came and landed in this grass in front of me here where I snapped this photo. And here's another closer portrait. Um, and it was just really exciting to see. And then again, in this last summer in 2021, um, I got to see them there again. 
And here's a photo from this past summer um, in uh, when one of these wimbrels was alighting at the top of a tree. So again, a bird I see in migration, but a really cool one to see on the breeding grounds, especially when there's you know, only a few breeding pairs probably in the province. But something really funny happened both times. Um, I have, I've seen these wimbrels in 2019 and in 2021. In 2019, while hiking in the marsh, the wimbrels flew in, like I described, came landed in the tree, came down and land in, landed in the grass, but they very quickly were distracted. And so was I, because I was in there with my friend Ian that year, and we heard this crashing sound coming through the willow shrubs. And this area does have a healthy population of grizzly bears. So it's always something we need to be aware of in there. But all of a sudden this massive bull moose appeared in the distance and the wimbrels went right into this bull moose to check out what was going on. So I guess they perceived this big bull moose as a little bit more of a threat than, uh, than we were. But it was pretty spectacular to see this animal walking through, through the willows there. And this past summer, while looking for these wimbrels, I also had a, uh, a mammal encounter in the form of these two grizzly bears. Now, grizzly bears have a very healthy population in this area. There's a lot of them there. So while hiking around, especially in these more lowland areas where these tall shrubs, it's something that you have to be very aware of um, because you often don't have all that great of a view in front of you. But thankfully, this encounter was about as perfect as it could have gotten. Um, I was in there this past summer with my friend Josh. We spotted them about 100 meters away in the distance. Um, these two brown blobs, they were actually rolling around in the marsh, like play fighting with each other. It was quite something. But it just took a few seconds for a wind gust to blow directly from us to them. And immediately they did this. They stood up, looked around in our direction. They probably couldn't uh, see it that well see us that well because these bears don't have very great like long distance vision but they definitely could smell us judging by the way they were you know, opening their mouths and smelling the air but this only lasted a few seconds they turn around and sprinted away in the opposite direction which is exactly what you want to see um, a good encounter if you're going to run into one of these bears on foot um, having them run away in the other direction is a, a great sign that they are wild animals and they're not used to having people around and they have some of that natural fear um, if anyone knows uh, about like reasons for seeing two bears like this together. I'd love to hear more. They looked like young bears to me. They, they didn't seem like they were fully grown. So my, I would suspect these were maybe uh, siblings um, that uh, they seemed a little big to me to be around mom. So I suspect maybe siblings that had recently uh, left mom, but um, I'd love to hear more if anyone knows about uh, you know social interactions between grizzly bears like this. Cause it was pretty neat for that little bit at first when they were rolling around and play fighting in the marsh. Another mammal that there's quite a few of in uh, the Haynes Triangle are red foxes. Um, and this one here came walking by with a mouthful full of nestlings. Um, I'm not sure what these are, these nestlings are. They look to me like maybe they're a thrush of some kind. Um, but uh, it's easy to feel a little bad for the nestlings. But this fox also has hungry mouths to feed. And uh, there are definitely lots of fox dens in the area with lots of little uh, baby foxes like this one waiting for their dinner delivery. Another really uh, amazing animal that I've encountered in this area is the Canada lynx, pictured here. Um, this was the first lynx that I ever encountered. I've since seen one other lynx up in northern BC, but um, this animal was walking through the woods. It stopped for this split second, gave me one stare, and then that was it. It never looked towards me again. In fact, I'd say if there's an animal that I've encountered that seemed the most like indifferent or like oblivious to me looking at it, it might be this lynx, um, which I hear is kind of standard behavior for them during some times of year. But lynx in this area are uh, very closely tied to the populations of snowshoe hares. So we have what are called population cycles going on. When there's a lot of hares in the area, the lynx have a lot of food. So the lynx population increases. And with the increasing lynx population, there's now a greater predation threat onto the snowshoe hares. So the snowshoe hare population starts to decrease. Well, now all of a sudden you've got a lot of lynxes and not a lot of snowshoe hares. So the lynxes don't have a lot of food. So their population starts to decline until it gets to a point where once again, the snowshoe hares can increase their population. And this cycle goes on and on over and over and over. So, so there's uh, periods of time when there's gonna be a lot of lynx and there's periods of time when they're gonna be a lot more scarce. But uh, they sure are incredible animals. Um, I'd love to see one walking around in the winter one time because they have you know, these very big 
feet and legs, which they use to kind of spread out their surface area and walk through the snow. Um, but this is a, a really, a really amazing animal. And here's one more photo I captured of a lynx. Um, it was standing, in, it was just standing in this spot in the woods that had a little bit of light shining onto it. And it just, I found in black and white, it really make that lynx like pop out of its environment against the, uh, the shade of the woods. Um, I want to talk about a few more birds because uh, birds are the focus here. And the Haynes Triangle of British Columbia is definitely the easiest place in the province to see willow ptarmigan. And you can see there's one crouched here underneath a, uh, a bush in the subalpine. That's the male there with that uh, kind of reddish rusty colored head. And here's the female. Um, she is a uh, a little better camouflage, although in these green grasses where she was when she when I took this picture, she, she did stand out quite a bit. Willow ptarmigan are so cool to me. They have really, they make really, really funny sounds. Um, and they're really beautiful. I mean, look at this. Here's a male with that stunning uh, red eye comb that they have. And uh, this is a pretty common bird in the Haynes Triangle. Again, some years I, I've seen more of them and other, some years I've seen less of them. But uh, every time I've been there, I've seen lots of willow ptarmigan, and they're just really fun birds to watch. So here's another photo of a male in that summer plumage. And here's a photo of a willow ptarmigan I took in June when there was still a bit of snow cover. And this male was in this patch of snow where he just stood out so much, which is just really unusual for me to see a ptarmigan stand out because they're normally so well camouflaged. Um, so that was, that was a neat encounter. But the Haynes Triangle actually is home to all three species of ptarmigan. So I've also encountered rock ptarmigan up in that area. Here's a male rock ptarmigan. For this shot, I was I kind of I had the option to photograph him out in the open, but I kind of moved so I was looking through this bush. So I get this foreground element, add a little bit of depth to the photo, and this was the result. And then there's also a white-tailed ptarmigan in this area. I've yet to see a white-tailed ptarmigan in the Haynes Triangle, but I have seen them up in the northern Rockies further east. So this is an incredible environment. It's absolutely stunning. Um, here's just a, a river that I've hiked up a few times up in the Alpine. It gives you a sense of what the ecosystem here looks like. And somehow, even birds that I'm used to seeing at home, like these short-billed gulls, which were formerly called mew gulls. Like, I mean, look how beautiful these mew gulls look on the breeding ground. They're so clean and pure white, and they've got these bright yellow beaks and these stunning like orangey reddish uh, eye rings. They look so stunning up in the mountains. Um, and my favorite bird in the world, I've mentioned a lot of favorite birds, but my favorite bird in the world is found in a similar habitat in the same areas as you find these short-billed gulls. And that is the Arctic tern pictured here. Um, the Arctic tern is an incredible species. And in case you're not aware of what makes the Arctic tern so incredible, this species breeds up in the Arctic, as their name suggests, and they do breed south into places like northern British Columbia as well. But during the non-breeding season, the Arctic tern goes pretty much as far as it could possibly go anywhere in the world. They fly all the way to Antarctica. So that is a, a long journey to make. So they go Arctic to Antarctica and back every single year. And um, scientists have put trackers on these birds, and uh, they've been clocked in at 90,000 kilometers in a single year. This is a bird that weighs as much as an iPhone. And I have written down here that in its lifetime, an Arctic tern can migrate 2.4 million kilometers, which is equivalent to traveling the circumference of the earth 60 times or making a round trip to the moon and back three times. So this is a really incredible bird. And as if that wasn't enough, they often will mate with the same pair for quite a bit. They, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll meet up with their same pair on the breeding grounds. They'll often return to the exact same breeding ground, the, the same territories year after year. And they live for 30 years. So it's a, it's a, it can be a pretty long lived bird. And this is a species that you find breeding up in the lakes and ponds in the Haynes Triangle. Um, I hiked up into this area in the Alpine in 2017 and was, I was greeted by a pair of Arctic terns who very quickly came over and hovered over me to investigate my presence in their territory. And then two years later in 2019, I hiked up to the same pond and was once again, like the exact same thing happened. And I just got to wonder if those could be the same terns after they've made a couple more trips to Antarctica and back. It's just amazing to think about. And that particular occasion, um, 
the sky was all beautiful and stormy and it made for this really stunning environment to take photos like the one you see here. And here's one more photo of an Arctic tern in this beautiful environment. Um, you know, they, they're nesting up in these areas and they're none too pleased to have you around. So I usually try to move through pretty quickly, but they make sure to escort you out of their territory. If you're ever walking through one of these areas where they're nesting, they will escort you right out of their way. So the last uh, group of birds I wanted to highlight in, the, in this presentation today are the little birds that are found in the Haynes Triangle. American pipits are very common up in the Alpine. They nest right on the ground, as does the horned lark pictured here. Uh, these are two of the more common species up in the Alpine. There's also snow buntings, which I've had as a flyover, but I've yet to actually photograph one kind of on the ground up there, but I'd love to get some snow buntings and breeding plumage up there. And there's also uh, birds, again, that are very hard birds to find in British Columbia, like this one here. This is the gray-cheeked thrush. Um, and the Haynes Triangle is probably the most reliable place in the whole province for this bird. They have a beautiful song, and they're a fairly common bird in the, uh, you know, the, the willows in, the, in these valleys in the subalpine in the Haynes Triangle. Now, I have to give credit again to Sid for this next one. Um, Sid found this northern mockingbird in June 2019. And this is, of course, probably in the, the ballpark of like a thousand plus kilometers in the thousands of kilometers north of where you'd normally find a, uh, a northern mockingbird. Um, and this bird was right at home in the subalpine of the Haynes Triangle. Um, I was there a few weeks after Sid and was camping right next to where this, this northern mockingbird had set up territory. And it was singing when I went to bed, like at midnight. And when I woke up first thing in the morning, it was still singing. So this thing, this bird was just singing nonstop. And it was mimicking like the shorebirds, like semi-palmated plover, lesser yellow legs. It was doing a lot of stays Phoebe. I even heard it doing what I considered to be a pretty good imitation of, of willow ptarmigan. So this bird clearly had been listening to its environment and was making all sorts of really, really cool sounds. Just a couple more species here to feature. The American tree sparrow is a common breeder in the area as is the golden crown sparrow pictured here. But there's one songbird that I really, really want to try to track down in the Haynes Triangle that I've yet to see. But uh, if you've been birding in British Columbia for several decades and you've been to this area in say this in the 60s, 70s, 80s, you may have encountered this bird here, the Smith's Longspur. Um, it's been, I think, several decades now since these birds were, were seen. Um, the Haynes Triangle is the only place in the province where the Smith's Longspur has been confirmed to breed. Um, and this is a bird I really wanna see. But they have, like I said, they haven't been seen for a long time. Now, kind of the leading theory, uh, it sounds like as to why these birds haven't been seen is because the habitat where they used to be breeding looks quite different now. These birds really like dwarf willow shrubs, like really short willow shrubs up in the, uh, in the subalpine, alpine areas. And as a result, uh, likely due to kind of reduced snowpack and longer growing seasons, the willows where these birds used to be found are now substantially taller. Like a lot of them are, in a lot of areas, the willows are way taller than I am, which isn't really suitable habitat for the Smith's longspurs. And I've hiked around quite a bit now in the Haynes Triangle trying to find suitable habitat for the Smith's longspur but I haven't really found what I'd consider like a big area of suitable habitat for them. So one of my big goals for future trips to this area is to spend more time hiking up there, trying to find suitable habitat um, and seeing if any of these uh, beautiful and rare birds are still perhaps breeding in the Haynes Triangle. And this photo here isn't mine. Um, this is the only photo here aside from the photo of me that, that I didn't take, but I wanted to include it because this is a bird that I really, really want to see. Um, and I'm just seeing a chat from Sid about Quatini Creek. I've hiked up Quatini Creek, yeah. Um, the shrubs were a bit smaller. Unfortunately, didn't find them up there, but I want to keep trying because uh, it would be amazing to, to rediscover this bird again. So with that, I want to conclude today's presentation, but I do want to say um, I am looking at putting together some kind of birding tour, birds and wildlife tour to Northern British Columbia. Um, I think this is a really spectacular place. Um, it's, a, of course, a huge area. So there's lots of different parts of British Columbia that, uh, that are of interest, but there's just some incredible birds and incredible wildlife and incredible scenery as you have seen today. 
So I'm just going to put that link in the chat. If anyone's interested, obviously, whoops, that was a direct message. Um, if anyone's interested um, in kind of a trip to Northern British Columbia to see some of these incredible things, I put together that form just to kind of figure out what sort of trip people would be potentially interested in, you know, what type of birds and what type of areas would be of interest to people. Um, and uh, also, if anyone has any questions or anything like that, um, I will, I'm here now, so I, I, I already see there's some stuff in the chat, but my email is also on screen. And if you're interested in seeing more of my photos, um, my social is uh, Liron underscore Gertzman underscore photography, and my website's on screen there as well. So I just want to say thank you so much, everyone, for, for listening to my presentation. I know I've gone on for a while, so I really appreciate you sticking around. Um, and uh, hopefully you can see why the north of British Columbia is my favorite place in the world. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. That was just a fantastic presentation. And I'm sure you're going to get a pile of questions now. You can <laughs> unmute yourself if you like to ask your question, or you can put your question in the, in the chat. We'll start with some of the questions that were in the chat there. Uh, and uh, let's just have a look. Uh, uh, so Susan McRae, Susan McRae asks, how do you tell the difference between the oven bird and the hermit thrush? That's a good question. So in the photos I posted, I purposely shared photos where they were like in the exact same pose. But when it comes to behavior and habitat, they're quite they're quite different in that sense. So I find like there are subtle like visual differences between them, like the beak shape and the beak color and just kind of the patterning. The, the hermit thrush has like a reddish tail uh, kind of concentration and reddish color on the tail which is all useful things to tell them apart, but I really find one of the best ways to identify birds is to kind of have an understanding for their habitat and for their behavior. So the hermit thrush is a bird that you find more in kind of coniferous habitats, um, often kind of around mountains and uh, in higher elevation areas. Whereas the oven bird tends to be more of a bird of these more lowland areas, like these aspen forests and these kind of more deciduous forests. Um, and they behave quite differently too. Um, the, the oven bird doesn't behave quite like your average warbler, but they be they're they're you know they move around quite a lot, kind of like a warbler a lot of the time. Um, so so there's behavioral things you can use to tell them apart, and they sound completely different. And both of them are quite vocal birds during the breeding season. But that's a good question because yeah, they do look really really similar. <laughs> okay, and uh, Sid mentions that Dave Fraser would like to get your Wimbrel records for 2021. Uh, for the I can uh, center. I can send those to, uh, to to Dave. And Sid also sent me a note that he gets type sevens around his house, which is incredible. Uh, the, the Red Cross build the type seven, so Excellent. that's amazing. Uh, Brian asks if you did you ever find a northern weir on your trips? So that's another bird I've looked for, and northern weirs have been found in Kluani National Park, which is borders the Haynes Triangle, like borders Tachinshini Alsek Provincial Park. Um, but as far as I'm aware, no one's yet to find any in the Haynes Triangle. But I would be, I, I would say there's probably a pretty good chance they're they're occasionally there. It's just that this the Haynes Triangle is such a remote area, and it can be really, really difficult to access the high alpine habitats where you would expect to find a northern wheat here, like up in these rocky areas and cliff areas. So that's another bird I that's on my radar because that would be an amazing bird to have as a possible breeder in British Columbia. Uh, Marietta, you asked about the recording. The recording will be posted on the Victoria Natural History Society YouTube channel. Uh, it'll probably take a couple of days, but uh, that will be the place to look for it. And I can send out a, a link for everybody that has registered for today. I also see a couple Thank of notes. You. That would be great. Uh, I also see a couple of notes about uh, the grizzlies. Um, and that they were almost certainly siblings. So that's that's good to get uh, confirmation there. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, anybody else with a question that would like to speak up? Oh, Todd Gibbard here. Hello. I was interested to see this particularly your part about uh, the triangle, the Haynes Triangle, in 1957. Uh, Bob Whedon and I uh, were working on Bob's uh, uh, doctoral thesis on the three species of ptarmigan in that area, in the, just below Haynes Junction. 
and uh, nice to see the area again. <laughs> uh, I didn't hear the birds on your recordings, but uh, Bob Weed can mimic them perfectly, or I used to be able to, if his voice is in a better shape than <laughs> mine is. Uh, but very nice to see. Uh, can some of your photographs be or stolen, whatever you call it, and put it on your, on your uh, as you're opening on your computer or anything like that, or are they, is that a no-no? I'm ignorant about computers, so. Um, if like if you if you want to put something as like your personal bed desk like desktop background that yes. sort of thing yeah yeah I would say go for it <laughs> as long as you're not like distributing them out and stuff like that then yeah that's fine <laughs> okay and I'll let Bob know because he's still alive as well that you gave us talk and then you have a website yeah yeah it's a stunning area and um, hey. there's definitely been some amazing like a, a, a long legacy of uh, people who have been visiting and exploring and uh, documenting the birds in that area. And of course, a rich indigenous history there as well. So, uh, so I'm, I'm far down the line of people who have, who have explored it, but it sure is an incredible place. Yeah, thank you. So before thank you, you joined us today, Leon, um, people had been asking about whether or not you guide tours up there. So I, I hope that you'll get inundated by people <laughs> wanting more information. But one question along those lines I, I wanted to ask is certainly your, your trips look incredible and look like something that, that I couldn't manage. Right? So uh, is, there, is there a way to enjoy a lot of the things that you've seen without having to climb mountains? Yeah, that's a really great question and something I've obviously thought a lot about when it comes to leading a tour in this area. Um, and I would say the answer is definitely. Um, the view, like, it, for example, the Haynes Triangle, it's extremely remote and the hiking is incredible, but like the vast majority, pretty much every single bird I've shown you in the presentation today, I've literally seen from the road. Um, some of the photos I showed you were like taken up in the mountains on hikes just because that's where I've like had my best encounters with them. But um, yeah, like the thing with the, the Haynes Highway there is it passes through all sorts of different habitats. I guess the one exception is the Wimbrels are a pretty strenuous bushwhack to get to, but everything else is uh, literally right by the road. Um, and like, mo like the, the Peace River region, for example, Fort St. John, um, all those warblers and stuff are very accessible because there's no mountains there. It's kind of like an extension of the prairie. So all the, the walking there is really, really easy going. Um, there's certainly great hiking opportunities for those that are interested in that sort of thing. I'd say probably some of the best hiking in the world, although I'm biased, but, um, but it's certainly possible to see all these birds, the vast majority of them from the road. And honestly, the road is also where you see the most wildlife because that's where you're covering distance and that's where you have openings in the habitat to actually see them. But yeah, that's a really good question. Great, that's awesome. Uh, Carolyn asks, did you find any Jaegers in the Haynes Triangle? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I have not. The, ac the only breeding record of parasitic Jaeger in the province is from the Haynes Triangle, but it's not from like the inland part of the Haynes Triangle where I've been. It's from the mouth of maybe the Tachinshini River, one of those rivers that flows out into the ocean there. I think Dave Fraser is the one, I don't know if he's here or not, but Dave Fraser is the one who uh, who, who documented those, um, but that area is only accessible by like a week long whitewater rafting trip um, or like if you have a float plane or something. <laughs> so, so that's a little bit uh, even more of a difficult area to get to, but yeah, there is, a, there is like that breeding record of parasitic Jaeger. Okay, last chance for questions. It says the Jaegers were where the Tatumshini meets the Alsek. Okay. Right. Well, Liron, this has been amazing. And thank you again. Um, it's nice to see you again. Um, yeah. And uh, hopefully you can come back over to Vancouver Island sometime and find us another really rare bird. Yeah, that would be fun. <laughs> okay. Thanks, everyone. I'm thanks, going everyone. To off the recording.